The following program has been rated TVG, general audiences. Most parents would find this program suitable for all ages. Hi, I'm Fran Foster of Setucket Lodge in East Bridgewater. Tonight's show is a 29th Masonic District Church service held at the Union Congregational Church on October 22nd, 1995, hosted by Right Worshipful Arthur H. Richardson, Jr. Scripture readings this morning are three Old Testament verses. They're probably not the, the best known chapters in the entire Bible, but in reading for today's sermon, they fit in so well with what I'm about to say that I just had to tie them all together. The first one is from the book of Habakkuk, chapter one, verses one to four. Habakkuk preached around the seventh century BC during the last days of the kingdom of Judah. And the theme of this great but little red book is that people must trust the Lord God and that God is indeed in control of all things. This may be found in your pew Bibles on page 811. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? What do you make me see wrongdoing? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack. Justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Second reading is from the book of Haggai, found in your pew Bibles on page 811, chapter one, verses uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, it is time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be on it, said the Lord. You have looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant, remnant of the people, obeyed the Lord, the God, and the words of the prophet Haggai. As the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month. The third reading is from the book of Zechariah, chapter eight, verses 16 and 17. Zechariah, in a series of visions, vividly depicts in very graphic nature the power of God, the control of God over the affairs of men, the importance of the spiritual strength, the judgment of God on sin, and the promise of things to come. 
in several instances, notably chapters 3, verse 8, chapter 9, verse 9 and 10, chapter 12, verses 10, chapter 13, verses 1, and chapter 14, verse 4, he predicts the coming of the Christ. Today's reading is but a couple of sentences and may be found in your pew Bible on page 823. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts one against the other. And love no false oath. For all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. I would like to introduce the masters of the lodges that are here today. We have Worshipful Brother Fran Foster from Setucket Lodge, Brother Worshipful Brother Roly Turcott from John Cutler Lodge, Roly. Worshipful Brother Dick Cusick from Paul Revere Lodge, and he's a short time. He's got about five and a half days to go until he is no longer the master of that lodge. And Worshipful Brother Ron Green, who read to you the uh, responsive reading this morning. Wherever you are. There you are. I don't know. On behalf of the Brockton 29th Masonic District and its eight constituent lodges, I sincerely thank the diaconate and the members of the church for their continuing support in allowing we Masons to share with you our love of God and our belief in the brotherhood of all mankind. And a very special thank you to the Reverend Colby for taking part in the services this morning. Thank you, Reverend. As I have spoken about on several previous occasions, Freemasonry, although assuredly not a religion in and of itself, is most definitely deeply intertwined with religion. We teach no dogma, nor do we espouse any theology, save that theolo theology to which all must adhere, and that is belief in and the love of God, the Supreme Being, or as we Masons sometimes say, the great architect of the universe. And as you might imagine, I have been asked on several occasions why we refer to God as the great architect of the universe rather than simply God. Well, I think the reason was that when Masonry was truly a stone maker's, stone worker's guild, the one person that these people truly admired was the architect, who after many, many years of arduous study and hard, back-breaking and very dangerous work, was able to design and create magnificent structures this, these stonemasons reasoned, was similar to the design and the work which God himself had accomplished when creating the universe. Therefore, the name of great or grand architect came into use and became synonymous with these men with the sacred name of God. Last year, I talked about the various passages that the Bible was open to when we conferred our degrees. I talked about Amos being the prophet of righteousness and tied that to the symbolic plum or plumb line on the apron of our junior wardens. Today I will delve, delve a bit more deeply into our ritual and read to you two of the biblical passages the chaplain reads to the candidates when they first enter our doors on the first degree, uh, enter the apprentice degree, and the second degree or the fellow craft degree. The passage we read for the first degree is the 133rd Psalm and is described as a passage showing brotherly love and reads as follows. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. They went down to the skirts of his garment, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now perhaps these seem rather odd similes to describe brotherly love and the beauty that comes from dwelling together in unity. But let me explain a little bit. First, who was Aaron? Why was he having precious ointment or oil poured all over him? Aaron was Moses' brother, the first high priest under Mosaic dispensation, and the oil was used to anoint him as such. Oil was a very precious commodity in biblical times, 
and to use it in copious amounts was to show a great admiration for the person so anointed. And you may well ask, if it was so precious, did they actually pour enough of it to go down to the skirts of his garment? Well, I think we tend to think of garments in those days of ending at the toes, but in actuality, they may well have ended at the knees or even higher. I mean, witness today's women. Their skirts may touch the toes, may end at mid-calf, the knee, and sometimes seem destined to end at the neckline. The passage also speaks of the dew of Hermon and the dew that fell on the mountains of Zion. The dew of Hermon, which is the highest mountain in today's Syria, is said to have the proportion of a light rain, which is also said to be true of the dew on the mountains of Zion. But here is a bit of a puzzle for biblical historians as Zion really has no mountains. But we think that the writer meant mountains in the vicinity of Zion. Dew to the ancients was a mystery and was believed to have descended from heaven. Of course, we know today that dew condenses from the atmosphere, but it surely must have seemed a blessing to the ancients of biblical times living in such an arid area of the world. Now, dew that condenses gently, imperceptibly, and copiously is symbolic of the qualities that should distinguish friendship, not only for our brother Masons, but as we are taught for all of mankind. Friendship should also be gentle and copious, and perhaps even mostly unnoticed and definitely not intrusive. On the other hand, dew that evaporates is symbolic of the transitory existence we share on this earth. The final passage, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Thus, in this, the very first lesson our candidate hears in the very first degree of Freemasonry, we are taught that the end of life on this earth is not the end of all that we do not spend a few moments here and then simply cease to exist. Far from that idea of instantaneous annihilation is the Masonic belief that as it is written in the Holy Scriptures, so shall it be. And what a beautiful passage it is. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The readings for the candidate for our second or fellow craft degree is certainly very familiar to all of us and it's from the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all things and all knowledge, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind, Charity envieth not, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, endureth all things, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. I don't think there's an awful lot of interpretation required to explain this beautiful passage from God's holy word, faith, hope, and charity. What a richness of God's love is contained in those three words, faith in God, the reason for our existence on earth. Faith, intertwined with love, make these words a world unto themselves. And hope, what is a human soul if it has no hope? A hollow, devastated shell a hopeless hunk of humanity. But give a soul hope, and you give it the world. Charity, charity is love of our fellow creatures, and by inference is extended to include all of God's magnificent creation. The passage for our third of Master Mason's degree, I will have to say for a later time, it is really kind of tough to interpret it. But if you care to go through it for yourselves, it comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses one through seven. A bit on the lighter side of Freemasonry and its origins before I get to the tough stuff. You have heard me say before that much of Masonic ritual is based on the building of King Solomon's temple, that magnificent structure set on top of Mount Moriah. Even today, there are many people who are trying to find a connection between our ritual and King Solomon. For my part, I am not greatly bothered with the premise that Masons regularly met within those great white walls. Neither am I overly concerned with the seeming great antiquity of our brotherhood. 
To some of my brother Masons, that may seem a bit blasphemous, but I assure you it is not. I am not overly troubled with trying to prove that King Solomon himself was a Mason, as has been suggested by many, many writers of antiquity. I, for one, have a really tough time trying to visualize good King Solomon coming back to his apartments in the temple well after midnight after conferring the Master Mason's degree on five candidates and trying to explain to his legendary 1,000 wives just what he had been up to all night long. Honestly, my dears, I was at the lodge meeting. <laughs> You're <Yeah>, right, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I don't think so. And if in fact he was a Mason, I'm sure he was not very much of a ritualist. How could he have possibly studied for the lectures for the degrees for those 1,000 wives running around cluttering up the palace all day long? And I don't think that was possible. I am fascinated, however, with the legends that surround our gentle craft and with the men who, have said, who are said to have adhered to its principles. We take great pride at the list of the great and the near great who have patronized our mysteries. Princes, presidents and potentates, war heroes, doctors, astronauts, engineers, inventors, cowboys, and yes, even street sweepers, have all joined us as brothers in our lodge rooms. What do we get out of masonry, you may well ask? Well, no one wants to become involved with something unless you get a benefit out of it. You put money in a bank to receive interest, however slight that may be these days. You go to work because you expect a return in the form of wages. You may take a life-saving course or donate blood, which, by the way, we Masons in Massachusetts do extremely well. You do those things because you may be able to assist someone in trouble. These are all extremely valid reasons for doing something or for joining an organization. But why did we in the beginning want to join? Perhaps we have a favorite uncle who was a Mason. Maybe our dad was a member of the craft, a friend perhaps are a business acquaintance who always seem to know just when to stand beside you to help, perhaps in ways not even spoken, but simply by being there. When I joined, my mother had already passed away, and shortly before I came the became the master of Setucket Lodge, my father also succumbed to that insidious disease called cancer. Both parents, the same lingering, wasting, debilitating death. My mainstay and greatest support was, of course, my wife, Dorothy. But somehow, when I was feeling sorriest for myself and my spirits were at their lowest ebb, I found a brother Mason on the other end of my handshake who helped me to see through the problems and the fears. Somehow, these men made me feel that I could stand up to what was happening during my dad's long illness. These brothers and their oftentimes unspoken counsel surrounded me with exactly what I needed at that time, sympathetic understanding, man to man. They were men to whom I could pour out my fears, my worries, and I did so knowing full well that no matter what happened, I had a bunch of tough-minded, tough-looking, gentle-hearted pussycats with real love in their hearts for their fellow man, more than ready and willing to stretch out the helping hand of fellowship. You see, Freemasonry practices that lesson which all religions teach no matter what their name. Do unto others that which you would have others do unto you. We Masons take a view of the world today that many find completely ludicrous because of the circumstances. These days, humanity seems to be looking for the lowest common denominator. The question most frequently asked seems to be just how much can I get away with? Society is fast becoming self-regulated. Self-seeking is increasingly more prominent, and allegiance to anything is secondary to selfish pursuits of the individual. Remember when welfare was a helping hand, when things, that, when, when things went astray? and really not a way of life. We see all around us high unemployment, people who are worried about holding on to the jobs they have, shrinking buying power, virtual warfare on the streets, commercialized sex, drugs being sold on every street corner. Even in our quiet little towns and neighborhoods, crimes of every kind are on the rise. Rampant consumerism works on us to buy things which we do not need, cannot afford, will never use, and which don't work anyway. The homeless are in nearly every city and town in the country. We are in a throwaway society where decent human values count for less and less with each passing day. We constantly see people who could care less about the dignity and the feelings of others. Face it, friends, society as our parents and grandparents once knew it is falling apart. And I'm sure we have all asked ourselves the obvious question, why? Simply put, people have forgotten 
are indeed were never taught the four cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. Remember those four. In researching for this talk, I came across a clipping I had cut out of Newsweek magazine in June of 1994 titled, What is Virtue? It was written by Kenneth Woodward. In it, he states that we are living in an age of moral relativism, where all ideas of right and wrong have been reduced to matters of personal choice. Therefore, since the truth cannot be known, as it depends on how you feel at that particular moment, your personal preference of right and wrong, if you will, neither then can the good be known. This dominant school of moral philosophy is being called, if you can believe it, enlightenment. In the United States, this outlook has produced a strong emphasis on rights rather than responsibility. And as Alice Dare McIntyre of the University of Notre Dame stated in the article, and I quote, the current disorder of contemporary American society is proof positive that this moral enlightenment is a failure. And may I add, an abysmal failure. Instead, this is also in the article, several of the so-called influential thinkers of today, people such as James Wilson of UCLA, Martha Nussbaum of Brown University, Charles Taylor of McGill University in Canada, and Bernard Williams of no less an outstanding school as Oxford in, Oxford in England, are proposing a renewal, if you will, of the ideas of virtue and character as a basis for both personal and social ethics. These same influential thinkers now recommend a return to the four classical virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. I think that's amazing. I am really beside myself that these influential thinkers have come to this conclusion all by themselves. All I really had to do was simply ask a member of the Masonic fraternity what lessons he was taught. And his answer would have been, in my first degree, I was taught the four cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. Freemasonry has been teaching the promise and the validity of these four cardinal virtues for centuries. These virtues cannot be legislated by governments, but they must be practiced by all, for the good of society, for the good of humanity, and our future as a civilization, or we will surely descend to the status of savages and brutes and beasts. In Freemasonry's first degree, justice is written in part, justice is that standard or boundary of right, which enables us to render unto every person his just due without distinction. This virtue is not only consistent with divine and human laws, but is a very cement and support of civil society. Without justice, there can be no peace, and God's magnificent creation is destroyed. Without peace, there is neither integrity of creation nor justice. And without respect for the integrity of creation, both justice and peace are absolutely meaningless. How much better off we would all be if mankind decided that brotherly love would be the rule rather than the exception. The Freemason of today is every much a builder as were the ancient stonemasons who are our operative predecessors and whose paths we follow. The difference being that the building that we work on is God's temple, which lies within each of us and is never finished. With every stone we lay, with every act of charity or kindness we perform, there is yet another stone to be shaped and set in place and another lesson to be learned. We Masons say that we are working on that spiritual building, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We work together as a fraternity to build a strong foundation, because without a strong foundation, even the most magnificent cathedral will surely fall. The more we work and labor together, the stronger the foundation on which the temple will rise in all its glory. We as Masons must impress not only on the man who would join our gentle craft, but on mankind in its entirety, that this building we hold so dear, the temple of the Most High God that lies within all of us, is in danger of crumbling, not from age, but from decay and indifference, and will surely collapse without the labor of their hands and the love of their hearts. Unless mankind is properly taught and influenced and guided by those principles, the very same principles that masonry has taught for centuries, those of love of God, the brotherhood of all mankind, and the cardinal virtues of temperance, fortitude, 
prudence and justice. There is no hope for a brighter tomorrow, not for society, not for freedom, not for democracy, and assuredly not for Freemasonry. Think about that for a second. Unless mankind is properly taught and influenced and guided by those principles, the very same principles that Masonry has taught for centuries, those of love of God, the brotherhood of all mankind, the cardinal virtues, temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. There is no hope for a brighter tomorrow, not for society, not for freedom, not for democracy, and not for Masonry. Well, it may seem that I am painting a rather dark and hopeless picture of we human beings, but with people such as those who are here today, and believe me, there are millions upon millions of like us throughout the world, people who love and trust in God and help each other in time of trouble, people who daily practice the cardinal virtues. I tell you now, there is hope for a brighter tomorrow. There is hope for humanity, and there is hope for the people of God. And you can ask Dorothy about this. I thought real long and hard trying to come up with a real great finishing line that would summarize all that I said today. The conclusion I came to is that to try to put into a few words, a, a few sentences, or even a book, the beauty of what Freemasonry teaches is to do it a vast disservice. What I hope that you heard this morning is that when you meet a man who wears a square and compasses, maybe on his lapel or on his ring, you realize right away you are meeting a man who firmly believes in the brotherhood of all mankind under the fatherhood of God and who daily practices those four cardinal virtues called temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. Give you an idea of what Freemasonry means to people. An old brass builder's square was found under the foundation stone of a bridge in Ireland in 1830. It was found in 1830. The inscription on the square was dated 1517. Now that predates by some 200 years the forming of the first Grand Lodge. Well, we know that the first Grand Lodge was formed in England in 1717 out of three lodges, regular, what we call nowadays, blue lodges. But we know for a fact, and we do have writings that date back into the 800s and the 900s, but this was dated 1517 and kind of puts into perspective just what Freemasonry means to us. I will strive to live with love and care upon the level and by the square. I like that, that's cute. A brother Mason, uh, John Cornish of New York, wrote a little article called, What is Freemasonry? In the home it is kindness, in society it is courtesy, in business it is fairness, toward the unfortunate it is pity. Toward the wicked, it is resistance. Toward the weak, it is health. Toward the strong, it is trust. Toward the penitent, it is forgiveness. Toward the fortunate, it is congratulations. And toward God, it is reverence and love. This is Freemasonry. I want to close with a little bit of a prayer. I really know nothing about the author except that he was a Freemason. It's called a smiling prayer. Give us, O oh Lord, a bit of sun, a bit of work, and a bit of fun. Give us all in the struggle and sputter our daily bread and a bit of butter. Give us our health, our keep to make, and a bit to spare for poor folks' sake. Give us sense for some of us duffers and a heart to feel for all the suffers. Give us, too, a bit of song, and a tale, and a book to help us along. And give us our share of sorrow's lesson that we may prove how grief is a blessing. Give us, O oh Lord, a chance to be our goodly best, brave, wise, and free. Our goodly best for ourselves and others till all men learn to live as brothers.